This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. So far, Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate, Rewind and Rewatch, Episode 4. We are members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find us on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast feed or on our own dedicated podcast feed on all the applications of your choice. I'm one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Iron Mike Spears. I'm joined, as always, by Case Lowe. Case, how's it going? Oh, who cares anymore? (laughs) We're just living some sort of messed up life i don't want to say simulation I know it bothers me when people say oh we're living in living in a simulation because that borders on nihilism and i don't really have patience for any sort of nihilistic tendencies but today has been a long day in a series of long days but i end my day talking to you about dragon gate usa and it is hard to complain about that yeah we are back here this week talking about the fourth show in dragon gate usa's history Fearless 2010, the first show where they got out of the uh, open the whatever gate uh, tendency that they'll be coming back to you very soon. But for this one, it was just called Fearless. And this show took place on January 23rd, 2010. But Case, we have a lot to go over before we break down the, the show because we talked a little bit about this on episode three. But a lot of things were happening in Dragon Gate and the overall wrestling landscape as this show as the Open the Freedom Gate show ended and as they went into like the two-month break before the show in Chicago. And I know both of us have started compiling notes. So uh, where do you want to start at as we're getting to this next show? I think we've got to start at the month of December in 2009. On the 2nd of December, Davey Richards makes his debut in Dragon Gate proper in Japan. He had just toured with Pro Wrestling Noah earlier in the year. Uh, Davey Richards being Davey Richards, that bridge was burnt. And Davey found himself in a position where he could hop on over to Dragon Gate. He debuts uh, on December 2nd in a match that did not make tape, but it is a match that I will read you the lineup because it sounds incredible. It is Davey Richards, Shingo Takagi, and Yamato versus Don Fuji, Masaki Mochizuki, and Super Shisa. Mike, that match sounds incredible. Yeah, that match is incredibly my shit. Uh, It makes sense, though, that he's already matched up with kamikaze this is something that would play out on the show there but yeah we have five of my absolute favorite dragon gate wrestlers especially during this time and then davy who is kicking it in all, on all cylinders i'm looking at the rest of this card right now and there's a lot of this show that i wish made tape uh tanizaki versus jackson florida okay whatever but susumu versus anthony w mori before he retired and then osaka zen roke versus akira tozawa and dragon kid as your semi-main event this was a hot card it's a real shame this wasn't taped because it it looked excellent and then dragon gate continued that momentum the next day cork and hall december 3rd 2009 davy richards defeats naoki tanizaki in a singles match and then just for uh, the purposes of framing what was going on in Dragon Gate at the time, the main event of that show was the big Nanawa-style elimination match with Shima, Gama, Don Fuji, Masaki Mochizuki, Magnitude Kishiwada, and Takeyua Sagura. They defeated the big six of BB Hulk, Masato Yoshino, Naruki Doi, Yamato, Shingo, and Akira Tozawa, a star-studded Cork and Hall main event right there. Yeah, and this is a match that during the time when this happened, I think everyone was like, uh, Sugawara was around, and then Kishiwada is someone who's been in and out of the company. I always really liked Kishiwada. Oh, I I will die on that hill defending Magnitude Kishiwada. But you have the Big Six, and this kind of was the formation of what would be called the Big Six era. They're considered the six big trueborns 
that were all debuted soon after the uh, Tory Month split. And this match, I mean, the, in a very weird year that we'll get into how weird this year was in Dragon Gate, which how it ended up here. This was a match that, like, the, there was a whole generation war where it was basically everyone who was considered up to and including a little bit of T2P was on one side. The Trueborns were on another side. And then you had, like, this weird, what they call themselves second classers, which were basically, if you think about people who were in the Jimmies and just everyone around that point, that's who they were as well. So it was just, like, this kind of odd, ha- odd half-hearted thing that brought back Sugawara. He was the first member of Agon to come back. And this is just, like, looking at this card now, like, just, like, up and down the card, like, this is really, like, the, the final days of Real Hazard and right into Deep Drunkers. I mean, we already have Kenichiro, Orion, KZ teaming with Kanda. You have Shisa Boy, Super Shisa, and Kaneth. You, you still have the uh, the Maraha Sapa tag team going on a 2 one match against Kagatora. And, of course, this is, like, the era where only, like, one big match from each show made tape when they did Infinity, so... Sadly, this Davy Richards versus Naoki Tanizaki match has been lost to the test of time. Yes, that's an unfortunate thing because I'm I'm fascinated to see just how that match worked. But luckily for us, the December sixth Dragon Gate show uh, made tape. Masaki Mochizuki defeated Davy Richards for the FIP Heavyweight Title in Japan. Both Mike and I watched that match. We will discuss it when we get to their singles match on the Fearless show. Also on that show, BB Hulk makes his first defense of the Open the Freedom Gate Championship versus Susumu Yokosuka. I refused to rewatch this match because I watched it once and really did not like it. That was the thing about Hulk in this time, and it kind of was. I was reminded of that watching Fearless when we get into that. But Hulk was not always having nonstop bangers at this time, and him and Susumu Yokosuka, at least for whatever reason, 2009 did not mesh very well. They went 22 minutes in it and a double header this was back when a couple of venues ago there used to be a kind of an equivalent of hakata starlings in sapporo called sapporo tyson hall that sadly shut down three years ago i want to say three or four years ago that i think 2015 maybe yeah 2015 because i because ddt ran a really cool farewell show there that i know Mas- I, it was like a harashima six man with masato tanaka that was a really good match right yeah so like this was like a really cool venue like if you're watching old tapes you will get it confused with uh Hakata Star Lanes, but it was its own thing. And yeah, no, that, that that Freedom Gate match was not a strong one. And then it just was one of those things that like it was the second half double header. Hulk, first time Hulk had a big singles title in his hometown. He is from Sapporo, so like that was a big thing, and that's why it went on top. We'll discuss it as we hit the main event of Fearless, but there are guys that BB Hulk works against, and there are guys that BB Hulk doesn't work against, and Yokosuka was certainly added to the list of guys that do not entirely mesh with Hulk. Uh, perhaps Dragon Kid on that list as well, but we will get to that when the time comes. December 19th, 2009, Ring of Honor hosts Final Battle with the first eye pay-per-view on Go Fight Live for Ring of Honor. So we are dealing with a changing landscape here because at the time, Dragon Gate USA is still kind of on cable pay-per-view, but cable you know, providers aren't necessarily carrying the company. Ring of Honor branches out. They decided to go with an eye pay-per-view, which features Dragon Gate USA's Young Bucks defeating Kevin Steen and El Generico, and the American Wolves with Davey Richards losing the Ring of Honor, Ring of Honor tag titles to the Briscoe Brothers. Yeah, and this is kind of notable time for two things. Like, I remember this being, like, the first big guy pay-per-view was th- was this. This was back when Go Fight Live, and that will become kind of a story as we go further into the series, talking about the early woes of I pay-per-view, because they were many more failures than there were successes. And that time was, if I'm thinking right, this was actually almost to the point of when they were starting to phase out Adam, uh, Adam Pierce's booker, right? Yeah, Pierce doesn't stay on for much longer. I'm trying to think... Well, he he leaves at some point during the Steen and Generico feud. Right. Because he was the big backer behind that, and Cornette didn't like it. Now, how long Pierce stays on after that? Man, off the top of my head, I do not know. Um, But we're still in Pierce era here. We're still in the HD net era. And now Ring of Honor, after losing their cable pay-per-view contract, is branching out into another form of live entertainment. That will become a story as we go along. 
as will the fact that on December 21st, the Young Bucks wrestle a dark match for TNA against the Motor City Machine Guns. We'll have more on them in just a second. December 22nd, F4W reports that Ryo Saito has ruptured his Achilles tendon and will be out of action indefinitely. He last worked a fatal four-way match on December 13th, or I'm, yeah, on December 13th against Dragon Kid, BB Hulk, and Susumu Yokosuka, and he returned on May 5th, 2010. So this is something that's kind of worth talking about now because this kind of plays into what happens in Dragon Gates 2010 because the big thing was Ryo Saito turned on Susumu Yokosuka to join Real Hazard and it looked like that, that Susumu was later going to join up Real Hazard and like it was going to be like the whole thing about how he was only going to join Real Hazard to screw over Ryo Saito but then he blew out his Achilles tendon and they started doing Kaneska again. So, like, this is, like, the start of when things kind of turned wrong there. And then it, it's kind of wild that he only had five months out for his Achilles tendon because this was definitely a, a period of time. Like, there was a good four to five years, basically, up until, like, the end of the middle school student council gimmick that he was doing that Rio Saito just was pretty snake bit with injuries. And this was, like, the first one. A show that was just snake bitten in the sense that it was painful to watch. <laughs> it's Final Gate 2009 that happens on December 27th. Just to briefly run down the matches that mattered on the show, Naoki Tanazaki defended the Brave Gate belt against KZ. Takeyua Sugawara defeats Noruki Doi in a non title singles match in the middle of the show. Open the Triangle Gate match. Aki Bono, Don Fuji, and Masaki Mochizuki win the belts, or I, I rather retain the belts, against Genki Horiguchi, Yasushi Kanda, and Nozawa Rongai. Open the Twin Gate match. Shima and Gama defeat Shingo and Yamato for the belts. And then the main event, a six-way steel, steel cage escape mask versus hair match. Masato Yoshino is the one trapped in the cage, and thus his head is shaved. Mike, very quickly, oh, Final Gate 2009, what was that? It was weird. That's what it was. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this was at a point that we're going to get to the the dying days of Naruki Doi's incredibly long Dreamgate reign. Like this is, it, he will not have the belt at WrestleMania weekend. It would already be a motto. But this show was also a big thing about like the generational war was still kind of like finishing up at this point. And Takuya Sugawara did not want to like, I think it was that Doi refused to give Sugawara a title match, and that kind of became a thing over January as well. I remember really liking the Zetterans team of Aki Bono, Don Fuji, and Masaki Mochizuki. They ended up holding that title for a long damn time. And the weirdness with the uh, Twin Gate titles, because Osaka Zenroku would pretty quickly vacate the Twin Gate titles after this match. And then, of course, like the big thing about the show was this was when Real Hazard turned into Deep Drunkers. They would be turning officially into Deep Drunkers in 2010. And this was the famous show that all the, the heel members of the roster were on top of the cage drinking beers as the show went off the air. And Masato Yoshino shaved his head, which is notable to say because we talked about in episode two the whole thing about both Shingo and Shima no longer having full heads of hair. This one was because of an Apuesa match, but this was probably one of my least favorite Dragon Gate big shows, I think. of. I mean, I would say of the last 10 years, but now that's 11 years away, so... One of my least favorite Dragon Gate big shows of all time. I'll put it that way. This is not one of those shows that you need to, you know, run to somebody's DMs and ask if they have it sitting on a hard drive somewhere. This is Most not... Most of us deleted it. <laughs> yeah, this is not worth your time. There's really... I mean, the cage match is fine. I like the Dragon Gate cage matches. I feel like I remember liking the Twin Gate match a lot, but the only Aki Bono match I really liked from this time period was the match that they won the belts, which was right. uh, Aki Bono, Fuji, and Mochizuki defeating Hulk, Yoshino, and Pac. I really liked that, and then from there, you know, they have a defense against Mazada, Nozawa, and Abdul the Butcher, which I just, oh my god, that sounds so bad on paper, and it was even worse in reality. They ended up losing the belts to Deep Drunkers team. Uh, later on but that is a mess of a show states or I, I guess abroad rather stateside things are only going to get messier for Dragon Gate USA as on January 5th Generation Me the former Young Bucks debut on TNA Impact and defeat the Motor City Machine Guns this sets off a cavalcade of talent moving around jumping around this is all stuff that we will discuss very in depth in our next episode as we discuss open the ultimate gate and the first wrestlemania weekend show that dragon gate usa has 
It is also a busy time for Gabe Sapolsky as on January 16th, Evolve runs their first ever show headlined by Davey Richards versus Kota Ibushi. We also have TJP versus Sawa and O'Reilly versus Bobby Fish on this show. Mike, do you have any strong memories of Evolve 1? I remember rewatching this show and the stuff that you think would be really good was really good. Uh, they had like this whole thing about like Jimmy Jacobs like doing these videos where he pretty much left the whole uh, the whole Ring of Honor access and he joined over towards he followed Gabe over here because he thought he'd be able to become like an ultimate artist and this is something that kind of started on uh, Freedom Gate and it will continue and and uh, we'll talk about this during Free Fearless. Uh, it's just important. This is an important thing to to note that. At this time, and as we get into 2010, the idea about what WWN, as it later be known as, drastically changes from how things were looking at as when DGUSA was formed, what they were going to try to do with it, as, frankly, Gage decided he needed to run more shows. Like, I think that's a pretty fair thing to say, that he just was wanted to book more, and with DGUSA, it was never going to be a monthly promotion until they tried, and it, we'll get, well, when we get to that, we'll get to that, but... The show itself, I remember uh, Richards versus Ibushi being a banger of a match. Yeah, the matches that I listed are the really good ones from that show. The Davey versus Kota, the TJP versus Sawan, the O'Reilly versus Fish. There's a really fun uh, Chikara touring match on that show. Frightmare, Hollowicken, and Quackenbush versus Brody Lee, Granakuma, and Icarus, which I gets lost, I think, partially because the Open the Historic Gate Chikara match is the better version of that match, but it also just feels so out of place on this show that has a bunch of compact bordering on shoot style at times. Like it actually UWFI. Yeah. But with guys that don't necessarily work that style, like Ricochet versus Eric Cannon is on that show, but Ricochet versus Eric Cannon was worked in a way that was like falsely hyper focused simulated realism i know those were just a bunch of buzzwords thrown in there but that's kind of <laughs> what that match was like this was th this whole show was the idea of taking buzzwords like pure sports build and legitimate competition and technical wrestling and throwing them on this show and it's a, a fun show to watch i think the early evolve stuff is really interesting to go back and look on I'm a Jimmy Jacobs fan. I will say Jimmy Jacobs versus Ken Doan, not worth your time. Uh, that's no reflection on Jimmy Jacobs. That is perhaps the man across the ring from him there. <laughs> January 17th, Brian Kendrick debuts for TNA at their Genesis pay-per-view. He is a surprise opponent debuting in the opening match and challenging Amazing Red for the X Division title. Brian Kendrick would go on to lose that match, which feels very TNA reading that out loud. The same day in Japan, Masaki Mochizuki defended the FIP belt versus Shingo Takagi in Osaka. Yeah, this is, things are drastically changing. And like when we start doing our research on this and when we start putting notes together, especially the last few days, it kind of really grasped me that 2009 was a, encapsulation of like what the idealized dg usa would have been in 2010 we're going to see how quickly that all went out the window and by the end of 2010 it's going to be a even more drastically different promotion than it was in the beginning of 2010 so it's a real interesting time both in dragon gate and in dg usa this is the year leading up to the big blood warriors and junction three feud this is kind of the table setting year for that in a lot of different ways there'll be some stuff that we get into on the fearless card that in retrospect, if you're a Dragon Gate fan, you should be like, oh, no, they were putting the, these people in motion for what would end up being the uh, big feud to end all feuds in 2011 through early 2013. I've got a bunch of notes here as we get closer to the show. January 18th, Dave Meltzer reports a bunch of matches that have been added to Fearless that we'll talk about. And he also notes that with the show being less than two weeks away, they have discounted second row tickets uh, earlier this week, which was or earlier that week, which was not a good sign considering one of the things that Gabe Sapolsky vowed when starting the group is that they wouldn't do sales and discounts. Dave goes on to say DVD sales for the promotion have been strong, but getting people to come to shows and attend hasn't been easy. The prior shows have ranged from okay to good, but second row available for a second Chicago. So at this late in the date, isn't great. Dave rhymes a lot at the end there, <laughs> Mike, something that, Gabe Sapolsky has always struggled to do. He's sold a lot of DVDs. He's booked a lot of stuff that has become critically acclaimed. He has always struggled to get people to come see the show in person. I don't know why that is. Do you have any idea? 
I think it was just one of those things that it was Ring of Honor was such much was developed as a DVD promotion, and it took so long for Ring of Honor to break that. And when he left, Ring of Honor was still having the issues that uh, other than like Mania Week and shows, which were the Dragon Gate focused ones to begin with, and then bringing people in. That was how he got people to shows. Like I remember, like at one time, like their biggest show capacity was when the Great Muda showed up in two thousand two. Like it just, it was something that, especially in this era, it was very hard to get people to come to shows unless you had the attractions, and especially in like this era where the indies are are still like rebounding after like Danielson at this time had just left. Like I when I was reviewing all the the notes, this was the time period where WWE ECW ended and NXT was about to launch. So. You had a lot of movement happening in the industry. Of course, this is right after the Great Recession. So it's not like that people had like this incredible amount of disposable income to begin with. And it just was something that there was such a wrestling DVD culture that I know I participated in in the late 2000s and pretty much up until the iPay-Per-View era where it just was, oh, wait, a lot of people are say, who went to these shows on, would post on message boards. This is when message boards, mat- message boards mattered a whole lot. We'll be getting into the Twitter and YouTube era very quickly in this promotion, but people would people who went to these shows live who were in the Northeast would talk about these shows. And then people like me who did not live in the Northeast, we would see these posts, we'd see these reviews, and then we would order the DVDs when the time came. It just was traveling to independent shows was not a thing. And you really had WWE at that time was still much higher than everyone else. TNA, this is actually the, about the time that TNA decided they want to run on Monday just to get like an overall sense of the wrestling industry. And in a lot of ways, Dragon Gate was the hottest promotion, at least in the West, to a lot of viewers because of the Ring of Honor thing. And just as something that, I mean, this fearless attendance ended up being being 450 people, which at that time, it seems kind of ridiculous to think about that. But I mean, 450 people, and like I don't know when AAW first con- was like consistently selling out Bourbon Street and then Logan Square. But this is just like was like state of the Indies. I mean, folks got to realize that until like 2013, 2014, PWG wasn't selling out Reseda every week or every month. It just was this was how the industry was at this time. It's very strange to me that this show did not sell as well. I was very surprised reading this because you're dealing with the Chicago crowd who had just watched Brian Danielson versus Naruki Doi. Davey versus Shingo and what was just a really fun show all around and whether or not this show lived up to the hype is a discussion that we'll get into but on paper Mochizuki versus Davey a three-way tag match with the Young Bucks Speed Muscle and, and Kamikaze and then BB Hulk versus Dragon Kid who were two established stars in the sense of Dragon Gate guys coming to America, it seems like this show would have drawn better than it did or would have at least been somewhat of a hotter ticket but this seems like something that has just plagued Gabe the entire time he's been promoting, up until his NXT partnership. Right, and looking over the card again and comparing it to Open the Untouchable Gate, yeah, you have Jimmy Jacobs in an established match, you have Brian Kendrick in that same match, but you lost Danielson. You don't have Shingo in a singles match, which was a big draw at that point. Like, Shingo was the established guy because he his career excursion was in Ring of Honor in places like Chicago. So... I see why there was a drop, maybe not as big of a drop as it ended up being, but I understand why there was such a drop between ticket sales, but still the fact that they're in the fourth show and they're not hitting that 500 ticket threshold, that was such a big deal that they hammered at the start. They wanted to hit 500 p- tickets, that was the break even, and they made money on DVD sales and pay-per-views. That was a very kind of scary thing, and we will talk about how that changes because because of like things like this and because of other things... The whole idea and the whole, uh, I don't want to say market, but the whole like economy for this promotion drastically changes in 2010. And it's something that I think that they realized that maybe in 2019, doing occasional shows like the way that they planned out to be would be a much more of a success. But in 2009, 2010, that wasn't the case. 
I've got three more notes for you. I will read them to you all at once, and then you can react accordingly. It is noted that Gabe Sapolsky is teasing a, quote, extreme surprise for the Chicago show, and that two talents will make their GGUSA debuts in Phoenix on the WrestleMania weekend shows, those talents being Sanjay Dutt and Human Tornado. Brian Kendrick is announced uh, returning to Ring of Honor for the 8th anniversary show on February 13th. He'll be wrestling Roderick Strong. And Evolve announced the main event for Evolve 2, Davey Richards versus Kyle O'Reilly. Mike, this feels like two truths and a lie, but it's really two lies and a truth because two of these things do not end up happening. That is right. And particularly the DGUSA things and the WWN things do not happen. Oh, yeah. No, you can go watch on, I'm sure, Honor Club has it. Brian Kendrick versus Roderick Strong does exist. It is those other two notes that do not come to fruition. But, Mike, those take us to January 23rd, 2010. And now, from the Congress Theater in Chicago, Illinois, I am ready to discuss Fearless 2010. Let's get into it. Uh, as I said earlier, attendance was 450. Do not look at what Cage Match has. That's probably the Dragon Gate worked number. At that that time. is the Dragon Gate work number because I believe they said like it, so the Dragon Gate number is one thousand twenty eight, which <laughs> it is not. No way, no. I the I I don't know it off the top of my head, but I looked at the Dragon Gate numbers for the first DG USA show, and it's like sixteen hundred people or something. Uh, so we probably have to go back and adjust some of our drawing records for Dragon Gate. Uh, maybe when guys like Shimo were on top, maybe those numbers are a little inflated, but alas, 450 people. 450 people, and I did want to make sure that I denoted this, down 100 from Open the Untouchable Gate. So Untouchable Gate, 550, Fearless 450, something worth keeping in mind as we continue on with the project. But let's get into the show itself. There was, it was a, a kind of a... a Overall, just off the top, this was another step down, I would say, of match quality, but I still ended it up. Like, when the show was over, I didn't feel like I wasted time on the show, and certainly at the time, I came out of the show going like, hell yeah, I gotta see a three-way tag match. I gotta see Misaki Mochizuki in America. I gotta see this, the first Open the Freedom Gate match in America. So, like, I was not, at the time, I was not disappointed, even though it was a step down, and even today in 2020, I was not disappointed by the show. Canonically, this is the first what I would consider to be true Drangate USA show where every match on this card is constructed by an angle for an angle or is pushing forth an angle. Whereas, you know, Open the Historic Gate is a dream match show. Untouchable Gate, you've still got your Danielson versus Doi, and the roster is still filtering out kind of who needs to be there, who doesn't roster placement isn't a definite thing on that show open the freedom gate we build to the first champion the champion is now here and we have matches that make sense if you're watching in order like i understand even tjp versus gran akuma because you're debuting a new talent there all of these matches make sense yeah absolutely and people who are big parts of uh the second and third show are part of the fourth show if we're going to like lock this in the era it's like 2009 in a lot of ways should be considered prehistory i would say other than like the the shows rock like the shows are absolutely i would consider canon shows especially if you're a dragon system fan but this really is like the true launch and like we will see how things get especially when we get to wrestlemania week and how things really were with dragon gate in 20 or dragon gate usa in 2010 yeah perhaps it's ominous to say but this is what dragon gate usa turned out to be right this is the the mark that the promotion would ultimately leave on the wrestling landscape and not necessarily open the historic gate or open the untouchable gate yeah and that's not a slight i would say i mean we we will episode five will have we we're we're preparing the 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 davy drama stuff because there's a lot of davy drama and the bucks will make their way back into dg usa and this will be a part of the wrestlemania shows but this is kind of like the core of this and really i mean you look up and down the card you have people on the show like eric cannon johnny gargano john moxley that become such big parts of the promotion at least like the first few years Grant akuma still around chikari sakagun jimmy jacobs like this is kind of what the core of the roster would be and they start fleshing it out more and more as we get into 2010 with more talents 
It's weird. This is, uh, at least on the DVD broadcast, the first Dragon Gate USA show that doesn't really begin with a match. Instead, we get a John Moxley and Brian Kendrick promo to start the show. Uh, Moxley says he's sickened by the fact that a man that gets his ass kicked for a living, a.k.a. Tommy Dreamer, is in the building. You can just, it's so clear that Gabe is in love with John Moxley at this point. Yeah, and it's kind of hard not to if you're someone who was like following at the time. Like John Moxley's promos felt like he was something completely different. His matches would finally kind of kind of get there, and I feel like this promotion helped him get there. But he was already pretty much a a formed character presence, and if anything, it, it it's more awkward the fact that Brian Kendrick was such a big part of this. Yeah, Brian Kendrick does not age well in this promotion. There's a lot of Brian Kendrick that I really like. I think. His first two Ring of Honor runs, uh, the 2002 to 2003 stuff, and then the 2005 run are maybe underrated just because, like, Spanky never had a Sinclair Best of Ring of Honor DVD, so a lot of that stuff isn't super accessible. But there's a lot of really good matches in that time frame. The DGUSA stuff, he just, he looks phony almost in the same ring as Moxley, who was cutting these legitimately convincing promos about how he wants to kill guys, how he wants to take <laughs> things over. Like there is an element of fear and danger that John Moxley is able to get across in these early. I mean, we're still talking about a guy who's working HWA. He's working CZW. He's working a little bit of IWA. This is just in the stature of the independent scene, by far the biggest platform he has ever had. And he is knocking it out of the park in a way that I did not realize one, that his push was this fast and this aggressive, but two, the Moxley stepped up to the plate and he knocked it out of the park. Yeah, and as we go along the series, we'll see more and more like him. Like This is all happening without him having an actual match on pay-per-view. He's had promos, he's had beatdowns, but he's not had an actual match on pay-per-view, which I think has been one of the things I think that Gabe did very smartly was he got, them, he got him in front of the crowd and get them working with these people that... Some of them he would have worked with with CZW and IWA Bid South, but a lot of these guys, not necessarily the case. You know, I mean, I don't know how many times that John Moxley was in the ring with Lince Dorado, like leading up to this, but like it's something that I think that one thing that Gabe really knocked out of the park was finding John Moxley, deciding, okay, this is a guy that I'm going to go with, and seeing how he took off over 2010 and 2011. And even just in the context of the guys that he's working with on this on these dark matches, because Moxley is in the opening fray match uh, and gets disqualified and then later works a another dark match against Darren Corbin, which he wins. But you're looking at guys like Kyle O'Reilly and Eric Cannon and Johnny Gargano and Lince Dorado, who reasonably, if you wanted to say, OK, which of these guys can wrestle Shima? You were going to say O'Reilly or Cannon or Gargano or Dorado before John Moxley. And that is something that doesn't necessarily plague Moxley throughout his time in the promotion, but it is something that is very noticeable and something that he has talked about that John Moxley just simply does not work the Dragon Gate style. Now, he has great matches as we go along, but those matches feel very different. So Gabe and not throwing him in the ring immediately and saying, go out there and wrestle Yamato or wrestle Dragon Kid or whoever and letting Moxley fall on his face. Gabe Spolsky is no idiot, and he's very smart for putting Moxley in these promo-heavy positions where he can establish a character far better than anyone on the show, quite frankly. I mean, no one is doing the level of character work, especially not Brian Kendrick, who feels very phony in what he's doing. Jimmy Jacobs is just starting to get something off of the ground, and it's a bit of a slower, I guess, launch with him. Moxley's there, and Moxley is defined, and it is ever-present in the opening promo on this show. Yeah, yeah, and it's one of those things that someone that I wanted to touch on that was a big person in Evolve, at least early Evolve, and did a couple of DGUSA things but didn't really stick around was Brad Allen. Because he was Brad some... Allen. Brad Attitude, also as he's known as, but he was a FCW guy that recently was fired, but he was like a big Carolinas wrestling guy for a long time, and he kept on doing, whenever they would have matches in the Carolinas, he would always be in dark matches, and he'd always be in squash matches. So, like, he's getting in the ring with people that have wwe experience he's getting in front of tommy jr who i think at this time still was a member of wwe office so it is very clear at this point that the if the eyes of the wrestling world weren't turning towards john moxley they would be soon if you have not seen the first five evolve shows go watch those and you would think 
that Brad Allen would end up being the next John Cena with the focus Gabe gives him on those oh, he loved shows. Him. He loved him. He loved Brad Allen. One of those, like, it's just like those evolved shows for a number of reasons feel very dated just because, again, like I mentioned at the top of the show, it was kind of just a promotion of buzzwords filtered in to create one wrestling organization. And then, you know, there's your Garganos and your Kylo Riley's and your Brody Lee's and guys that went on to do big things. And there is also a heavy presence on Brad Allen on those first <laughs> five evolved shows. Uh, yeah. And he would pretty much by 20, by the end of 2010, he'd not be a part of any of this stuff going forward. It's just as funny that. That for like this six month period, Brad Allen was Gabe's guy that he thought he might be able to make something out of. He still wrestles in the Carolinas, Brad Allen does, but you know, that was kind of it for this kind of exposure here. But yeah, like getting back to this opening promo, it is very clear the dichotomy between Moxley and Kendrick, and that become very much of a thing going forward. The thing that I forgot when I watched the show, and I don't know if, if your version, of, I think your version of this had it too. This was supposed to be like a pre-show thing, and then went straight into what they called like the last dark match between TJP and Gran Akuma, and I did not remember that being a thing when watching this. No, I did not either, and for the purposes of this show, because the match, I'll say it, was damn good. TJP oh, versus Gran Akuma is what kicks us off. Mike, yeah, how do you feel about this? It was so interesting. TJP was like at this time kind of getting his his name further out there. Like he did the Puma things. I forget if if the TNA suicide thing really was around this time or if it was before this like i i'm certain that garrett kidney would get in me and like lay this out to, to me perfectly but i don't remember this but tjp was like a big west coast guy who was a big anoki dojo guy so seeing him against gran akuma they don't necessarily have that much similarities at least of working each other but i ended up really enjoying this like nine minute match it was really well worked had kind of a deflating finish but also was the idea that tjp works a different style than everyone else and it worked in the idea of this match is this was also this crowd was not as hot as previous crowds and i started noticing that the further we got along this show yeah it is at times a deflating crowd it is a bummer to just be in that atmosphere which i talked about on open the freedom gate of how i just didn't think the arena looked as nice as it did uh for historic gate and we once again just see a decline in production and care to some extent, just again, stuff that Gabe has never really been good at. And we don't need the screenshot of the FIP show with the ferns in the background to prove that, that <laughs> there's just a level of production that Gabe Sapolsky has never cared about. And maybe that comes from, you know, an ECW tendency of, oh, you know, we'll make it work. It'll look fine. But the fact is, most things that Gabe has run do not look fine. And even though he's in what, you know, was a step up from the Rexplex or whatever building they were running in Rawway or the Frontier Fieldhouse in Chicago Ridge, Illinois, like the Congress Theater is a nicer building in terms of uh, just its presence in the city. But Gabe is kind of making it look bad. But he's hosting matches like TJP versus Gran Akuma, who, you know, TJP at this time is like the NWA junior heavyweight champion. Like he's primarily working NWA events at this point. He's working PWG undercard. He's still kind of doing stuff for TNA, but you can tell he's in a career no man's land. And I think had uh, TJP had his way, he would have been a focal point for Dragon Gate USA. And the fact that he beats Gran Akuma here, he makes him tap out shocked me because I did not know the result going into this. It's a show I had seen before, but I just didn't remember the finish of this. You know, Gran Akuma is pushed as really one of the top Americans. I mean, it he's looked at as the fall post of Kamikaze USA or what ended up being Kamikaze USA. But Akuma is given a large spotlight on those first three shows. And for TJP to come in here and make him tap out of the opener, I was very surprised by that. Yeah, yeah. And it's one of those things that we still, we've been referring to Kamikaze USA, but it's still not actually Kamikaze USA yet, but it's still very firmly a nucleus of Kamikaze USA is formed by the end of this show, and he's a part of the big post-match stuff in the main event, but he's dropping a fall in the early match against someone that I'm looking at his, where he was running at that time. It just was someone that didn't necessarily work a whole lot Midwest, and he came in there. He did have some buzz. Like, let me get this right. He did have buzz at this time, but he just was not considered like a huge star, and he came in here and beat... One of the two, I, I remember us saying on the first show or on the uh, show and uh, the second, the, the second show, the second show of the Untouchable Gate that we kind of had our four big American stars that we were going to see at least idealized. And he already t picks up a win against one of them. 
I have said before that wrestling is better when CM Punk is involved, that wrestling is better when Loki is involved. And although he is a step down from those guys in terms of talent and stardom, wrestling is better when TJP is involved. He is a guy that will burn bridges, that will have bad attitudes, that will rub guys the wrong way. But when the bell rings, TJP is honest to God, one of my favorite wrestlers to watch. He constantly entertains me. Yeah, and this finish was really kind of cool on how he was able to get Akuma was looking for, I think it was supposed to be his exploder and off the top rope, and then you had a, a TJP evade that and then locking in this figure four death lock that looked really nasty and immediately got the tap out. And it just was an interesting match that I'm glad that they had the time to put this on the show and they decided to make this part of it because it was a neat little match and it was one one of the matches that I completely forgot with the test of time, but it was this it was better than some of the matches on the main card. Mike, we go from there, not <laughs> to match number two. We go to a Davy Richards promo in which Davy Richards is sitting backstage and he looks at the camera and he says that he, he was just in Japan with Dragon Gate and he got off the plane from Japan and his wife picks him up at the airport and she says, where's the belt? And Davy says, I lost it, okay? And then Davy Richards does an honest to God, great job of putting over the FIP World Heavyweight Championship. He talks about how Roderick Strong and the Homicide and Brian Danielson and Eric Stevens have all held this belt. And now it was his job to carry on the lineage. And it turned from this ridiculous Davy purple where I could just see him sitting in the car snapping at his wife. I lost the belt to Mochizuki. Leave me alone. And then he sits in silence as Metallica plays faintly in the background and then transitions it into what we have discovered is we start ironically liking Davey stuff and then Davey turns it around in a way where it's like, oh no, that was just a really good promo. Oh, it was absolute meathead dumbness out of Davey. Like I have this written down my note notes, dumb, dumb Davey promo talking about the tile against Mochizuki, but it was like a charming promo. Like he is a fully fledged person and he has his wife who is more concerned about his matches than he seems to be. He seems to be very petulant. And he, and I mean, he was someone that when he came in and he had a fully formed idea and he was like, I lost against Mochizuki. Mochizuki's now champion and I'll get my match back. And it's just like, you could tell that like at least he is still pissed about losing this belt. Now, is he pissed about the booking of losing this belt or was he just actually pissed about losing the belt? We will find out. Mike, what about match number two? So match number two was something that was built up on open the freedom gate it was a tag match between chikara sekigun as they're called this is the touring team of mike quackenbush and jigsaw defeating the uh, i don't know why super crazy is here other than it's super crazy but super crazy shima so we have three-fourths of that salute to sky the tag match uh mike quackenbush got the pin with la mercia in about 18 minutes it's one though it, f- it feels like one of the longer matches on the show and case Mike Quackenbush gets in the ring with Shima again, but what happens? Well, once again, Shima ate his lunch. Uh, Shima proved that everything Mike Quackenbush does, Shima can do a better version of. We knew this going in. (laughs) I've known this for a long time, that Mike Quackenbush, God bless his heart, is just a diet version of whatever a Japanese junior, whatever luchador, whatever guy he wants to be, there is a better version of out there. And we see it both with Shima and quite honestly with super crazy in this match. Super that they crazy can kind of run circles around quack. Super crazy was so much better in this match than in that uh, four way match with Skyda. And it's super crazy. It like was just have it was feeling himself. Him and Shima were goofing off the entire time. Like the whole storyline was here was that, the uh, veteran team did not take the Takara guy seriously. A whole lot of Shima playing mind games with them, and then they, they basically really teased out the Shima versus Mike Quackenbush face-off, and it's really funny. Like, Quack does, like, a real convoluted hold in which then, after, in order to break up the hold, like, Super Crazy gets in the ring, waits for two seconds, and then just pops him in the mouth. It was just hilarious stuff to watch. I was fascinated by the structure of this match because it's it's a a weird match it's well uh, yes in stages i I will say the structure of this match was very slowed down uh it it seemed deliberately paced to where super crazy wouldn't be exposed working against quack and jigsaw even the speed that especially at this time like shima could bring to the table like shima could bring it if he really had to but they work 
a, a more deliberately structured match that I think was designed to play into Super Crazy's favor, but instead, it really just put Shima in an environment to thrive, because I don't know about you, <laughs> I felt like Shima was the most over guy on this show. Oh like, yeah, absolutely. There, there was just a level of overness that Shima had that... Uh, no one, not even BB Hulk, not even Shingo, not the Young Bucks. Nobody really had the Shima factor on this show. It was it was his show to steal, really, and he did it in the opening match. My issue is this match would not end. Seventeen fifty for we'll call it the second match on the card. Gabe wanted to call it the opener. Why did this match go eighteen minutes? It was painfully long for a match that structurally wasn't that bad but i just i the eight minute mark i was ready for this thing to wrap up and it just never did it never did but it gave us more opportunities to watch shima just be the most indulgent shima person possible like this is a there's something about and we haven't really talked about it on open the voice gate a lot because of the the strong heart split in owe but Shiba is someone that you could tell very clearly when he does not want that that he thinks someone is either beneath him or he just doesn't want to play ball with them, to be frankly. And throughout this entire feud, I don't remember this feud being so much just Shima not taking Chikara seriously, but this happened here again. And yeah, Shima's the most over person on this show. It's also worth noting that I'm looking back over my notes here. The reason why they vacated the uh why him and Gamma vacated the uh the Twin Gate title was that Shima tore his, like, strained some tendons in his knee. He was working with a very bad knee injury, and he'd be off a, a couple of Chikar- a couple of weeks of uh, Dragon Gate shows after this. Like, he had a noticeable knee brace on. This is also, like, if you want to talk, like, 2010 Shima versus 2012 Shima, this is also definitely when you start seeing his speed go down a little bit here. Like, this is, like, one of the last, like, super fast Shima matches, I would imagine. Mike, I've been just thinking in my personal life a lot lately about confidence and just the idea of stepping up to the plate because I'm sitting at home, I'm laid off. I'm doing online classes that are weird because they're mostly theater classes that we're now doing over zoom, which is a complete and utter disaster, even with trained professionals involved. But I have just, I don't know. I'm at a point in my life where if I had the professional opportunities I wanted to have, I would jump on those opportunities. And obviously that is easier said than done, but it relates to Shima because there are times in this promotion as we go along where guys will be put in the ring against Shima and they will step up to the plate and Shima might not respect them as a wrestler, as a performer, maybe even as a person when that match begins. But by the end of the match, they have altered their career for the better because Shima now respects them. And I think Quackenbush had a real chance early on in this promotion to show Shima that he could step up to the plate, that he could knock it out of the park, that he could hit whatever sports metaphor you want. Mike Quackenbush could have done that. And Quack got eaten alive every single time he was in the ring with Shima. And I don't think it's an accident that Chikara doesn't stick around for much longer. Yeah, and it's a little bit to the detriment of someone like Jigsaw, who was a very convincing face in peril in this match. Like, Jigsaw across the first four matches, first for shows has been solid in every single match of them and it's disappointing to see he'll still be a part of the promotion but he'll be obviously scaled back and it's kind of just kind of disappointing to see because this is kind of the peak of the Chikara thing they'll still be involved for the next few years but at this point like there will be a big match in in Phoenix but after that point Chikara gets started getting cycle down cycle down cycle down and in about in about 50 weeks, I will have some really strong thoughts on Jigsaw booking. But for now, and I promise you those takes will come, but for now, my focus is on Quackenbush. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I mean, woof. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. Like, Shima is someone that we'll talk about. There, there are a couple big examples in this promotion of Shima taking someone, maybe not necessarily having, like, the, the match that fully highlights his opponent but afterwards their career will change and maybe shima will take them under his wing or they will be continually up against shima for like the rest of the promotion and it will raise their stakes mike quackabush is not on that list there is a hype video that follows this match that shows dragon kid standing backstage (laughs) and that is the entire video and we talked in the last episode about how they did like the cuts to the four competitors in the freedom gate match and how shima is shadow boxing just looked unconventional. I will take that a hundred times before I watch the camera. It was almost like the WWE style of backstage interviews where they show Dragon Kid and he does his little motion and then the camera stayed on Dragon Kid for way too long. 
What do you think Dragon Kid was thinking about then? Do you think he was thinking about his rescue cats or breakdancing moves he's going to start learning? Dragon Kid was thinking, I want to go home. I don't want to be in the Congress Theater in Chicago, Illinois. That's, and who could blame him? That's fair. That's fair. And that leads us to the second match of the formal pay-per-view. This was Jimmy Jacobs versus Brian Kendrick. Kendrick gets the win. And after six minutes and 44 seconds, this is the shortest match on the show. And it felt like one of the longest. And this is kind of where we really get to see where you were said like Kendrick does not. Kendrick in 2010 does not age well. Because the big thing about this match was Brian Kendrick brought out Lacey. Yeah, so Kendrick says in his pre-match promo that he wrestles people on a physical and emotional level, much like Jimmy Jacobs, but he also wrestles people on a psychological level. He made some calls. Out comes Lacey, who was uh, had aged very well in the year and a half she was gone from Ring of Honor. It was delightful to see Lacey again. Uh, and then they have... Just uh, this whole segment and what this bleeds into is just one of those, like I file it under like Gabe had an idea and that idea did not totally pan out. But we it get a, a six minute match between Jacobs and Kendrick that is plotting an awkward and then Lacey seduces Jimmy Jacobs for distraction. And then Brian Kendrick hits slice bread for the win. I give it a star and a half. I did not like this at all. It just was like really long and unnecessary and then the post-match stuff where then uh like first i want to point out jimmy jacobs looked like a mall goth version of bb hulk in this match like beforehand like the looks that jimmy jacobs was cycling through at this time were kind of incredible in retrospect like it was a powerful look like mall goth uh bb hulk and it just was just six minutes that felt like 12 and then you had the whole thing afterwards which was a long brawl that went on like twice the length of that and Brian Kendrick wouldn't be around for too much longer, but we still have to put up with this for this. Well, time. and it's, it's a brawl specifically between Tommy dreamer and John Moxley. So dreamer appears, he brawls with Moxley all around the building. It's, you know, part of it's dark. Part of it is just Jeff Jarrett walk and brawl. And then they get back in the ring. Maybe they got back in the ring. Maybe it was in the crowd. I don't remember. All I know is that Tommy dreamer, hit, Tommy dreamer hit a DDT on John Moxley and then left, which I thought was really dumb. Yeah, it just was one of those things that they, they built it up there as a real real long crowd brawl, and it was a crowd brawl that you didn't see a lot of because of the production things you mentioned about Gabe earlier. And it did kind of like, this was like Mo what Moxley was doing on pay-per-view at this time. And, you know, it, it, trying to have the idea that he was trying to take out all these people. Like he talked about wanting to kill Tommy Dreamer earlier in the show, and he had his attempt, and he didn't, he didn't succeed in that case at all. And it just was... The first two matches were not what I wanted out of DG USA. I remember at the time being kind of frustrated with it, and then I really fast forwarded to the next three matches, which I gotta say, we had we had two title matches and a three way tag team elimination match. But before we get into the next match, let's talk about something we talked about earlier, the first match between Masaki Mochizuki and Davy Richards. Yeah, so just real quick on their Dragon Gate match, which I don't maybe I can try to make that available to the public. I don't know. I don't know what I'll do with that, but I, I sent Mike the match cause I had it laying around and I, you know, it's at that point, the Dragon Gate match was actually their second singles match. Cause if you remember, they wrestled each other at all-star extravaganza two, uh, when Mochizuki came over for the second, uh, WrestleMania weekend ring of honor shows. So this was weirdly Davey versus Mochizuki two. It's a good match, much like their Chicago match. I actually, we were kind of talking before the show. They're roughly the same match. Uh, it's, exactly what you would expect from these two just in the case of the japan match mochizuki gets the win and in the case of the fearless match davy comes out on top right and it's interesting that we'll get into this in a second like the, the match here is very emblematic of what dragon gate audiences were at the time davy and dragon gate proper was never going to be a great fix if he was a member of Kamikaze, he would make sense because he would fit in with the vibe there, and he was teaming with Kamikaze on this tour. But the crowd response to nearly everything was pretty lackluster. But the match itself was just it was just was very interesting to me. It was it was worked in a way that a non Dragon Gate crowd would probably be a lot more into it, almost to the detriment of the match itself and its and how it came away with it. But it just was something that like it happened. It was cool to see, especially like this was a time where Mochizuki was was kind of cycled down in Dragon Gate. He was mostly teaming with Don Fuji. Great underrated tag team, especially if you're someone who wants to watch 
some more of the hard hitting Dragon Gate style. Mochi Fuji was a great tag team, but it just was like one of those matches you watch and like looking at the promotion in context, you could see why this Hokkaido crowd was just like sitting on their hands during it. Yeah, Davy in Japan for Dragon Gate specifically just did not work. I- it just looks weird. And when you look at even Davey's cage match, like the Dragon Gate USA stuff, yeah, it's Dragon Gate USA, Gabe into the star, Davey Richards was the star at the time. Him touring in Japan, I I would like to know more about how it came about. And, you know, uh, for a number of reasons, it didn't continue. But it just, and watching this match, which again is a good match, but it feels so out of place in the landscape of, of the promotion at the time. It's, it's really fun in a way i wish we had that tanazaki match to have a larger sampler sample size of what davy did with his time overseas it's just very strange to look back on i imagine it was very strange in the moment and it's a blip on the utterly bizarre career of davy richards you know and it's just bizarre career yeah yeah no this is just like a part of it he worked one tour in dragon gate and this was the match of it that made tape he left before a final gate because that was traditional for the gaijin to go home for christmas so, like, that was it for him in Dragon Gate. But getting into this match, uh, this FIP match with Davey and Mochizuki, I have a little fact nugget that you might know, Case, you might not know. I just okay. want to throw out there. This was not Mochizuki's first match in Chicago. Oh, okay. You've I thought I had Mochizuki in America trivia, but you have clearly stumped me. All right. Masaki Mochizuki had a match where he talked about it after Koji Katao died, that he came and he wrestled as Hideo Nomore in, on October 21st, 1995, on a AAA ship. Okay, I'm looking at this now, and I'm enthralled. Keep going. I, I remember him talking about, like, this was, like, one of the matches where he was trained to be a karate fighter, and he was told, oh, you're going to be doing wrestling now, which was a very common thing in the 90s and especially in japan like if you were a mixed martial artist you would be brought into wrestling and this was like one of his first matches because you like you take a look back at uh at cage match and i'm certain there's more matches like this but this was maybe his ninth match ever was in chicago illinois and he talked about it like after kochi katao died about like how it was as a student of katao and being like forced into wrestling and having to go to america for a match so yeah this was the second time that misaki mochizuki wrestled in chicago Okay, I'm blown away because I also had a Mochizuki tidbit about him wrestling in the States, but I have to look at this card again. Okay. It's a six-man tag between Cactus Jack, Psychosis, and Sabu versus Rey Mysterio Jr., Super Calo, and Winners. It is a six-man tag with Public Enemy and Tommy Dreamer versus the Eliminators and Two Cold Scorpio. I literally literally just sent someone a DM asking if they had this footage or if this footage exists i am completely fascinated by this show that i did not know existed i mean it's triple a when they were in the 90s especially like in the like there because this was i'm trying to remember when when when's world collide was my my brain is so devoted to dragon system stuff that it it would have been 94 i think october 94 so this is like right after it when triple a was doing a bunch of shows in america and i guess I, i i'm right now going to look up to see what else koji katao was doing in 1995 because it is just like a, he has had such a he has such a wild and bizarre career and of course coming out as a former uh he was the uh, former yokozuna that was kicked out of sumo so it's just kind of a wild he, he it's a wild ride with, with koji katao well i was going to bring up that this i was going to say it was that uh in between uh his ring of honor debut. And then this match, Mochizuki worked in the States one more time, which is true. But do you remember what show Mochizuki would have teched in think America as a whole here that Mochizuki would have worked in between these two shows? Oh, Hawaii. Yes. Which have you seen these Hawaii shows? So Dragon Gate partnered with action zone wrestling in September of 2008. They put on a show in Hawaii that featured Kness versus MKZ, Horiguchi versus Tanazaki, uh, Mochi Fuji versus Gama and Kanda and Hulk Yoshino and Doi in the main event versus Dragon Kid, Pac and Shingo Takagi. Have you seen this show? I don't know if this show ever made tape. So I think I've seen the main event. 
Okay. I think that one aired on an infinity. This is just, this is, if you're ever wondering, oh, I wonder what Mike and Case talk about off the air. It's <laughs> us sending us links to shows and going, have you seen this before? Do we have access to this? Um, as for Davey versus Mochizuki in Chicago, it is a weird parallel to everything that is happening on this show where it is not bad, but is it is a slightly lesser version of what be, what came before it. Mochizuki versus Davey is a less entertaining dumb jock match than Davey versus Shingo. The dive Davey does into the crowd is still stupid, but not as stupid as the dive he did versus Shingo and way, way not as stupid as the dive he did versus Yamato. Okay, so I'm going to interrupt you here. He yes, didn't even ahead. touch Mochizuki in this dive. How can we say that this is less dumb? I feel like he caught him there. Again, the Yamato dive, Yamato has to jump for Davey to catch him. That's At least fair. I thought Davey, I thought Davey grazed him here. He still, man, he hit the ground so hard. I cannot believe he was doing these dives. Cause I just don't like, I Davey. don't know. I like, I'm not a wrestler. I don't like, like I, I have a very low pain tolerance. It's unfortunate, but like it plagues me. Like I just don't like being in pain. It makes me very uncomfortable. David Richards is hurling himself at the concrete floor with the added obstacle of there being a steel guardrail in between his pursuit of high speed velocity and crashing almost neck first onto the ground. Like that was probably, I would say, the the peak of this because these two guys, for like whatever reason, I don't think they had great chemistry. No, they they don't, and I don't know why that is, because Davey would do really well against guys that worked his style, and Mochizuki has proven, you know, that he can brawl and kick and strike with the best of them, but these two together just never really meshed. Yeah, and, like, that's the disappointing thing about this, because Masaki Mochizuki, I guess, over, like, the last four years has kind of become my favorite wrestler to watch in the ring, especially since Akira Tozawa left Dragon Gate, whenever there's a Mochizuki match. Like, y- you've recorded enough audio to me to know, like, I get, like, a certain lilt in my voice, and I get a little excited as soon as this happens, and this just did not reach that level that you would think, especially how you would think about 2020 Mochizuki, not not happening in, in 2010. And it's kind of disapp- disappointing, because this could have been, like, another one of those matches in the Pantheon, where we'd be like, Masaki Mochizuki is the one of the 10 best wrestlers of all time. But we can't say that because his match did not work that well. It's uh, one of those things with Mochizuki where, I, first of all, I think if there is a dip in his career, it is happening between 2008 and 2010 because he's de-emphasized sure. in the booking. There's still really, really good stuff. All of the Fuji tags. Again, he has the one good Aki Bono uh, match in Dragon Gate. There's a lot of stuff that he's doing well. But if there is a dip, it is this time period. But we're also talking about someone who, like, I gave this match four stars. We're talking about it like it fell flat on its face and that it's, you know, a, a two and a half star special. I gave this match four stars. It's just when you put Masaki Mochizuki in the ring, even at this time, but especially now, I mean, I, uh, when you were saying, you know, your piece on Mochizuki there, I'm thinking, well, God, I, Masaki Mochizuki, I guess he is my favorite wrestler of all time. I mean, it would be him and Kenta and, and Rey Mysterio to some extent, and maybe the Young Bucks, but there's no one I enjoy watching more than Masaki Mochizuki, especially now that we're living in a post Akira Tozawa in Dragon Gate universe. And so we're, we're mourning this match that was still great, but Mochizuki has just messed up our standards for what he <laughs> is outputting. Like, it's just insane yeah. to think it's like, Oh, only four stars, but it's four stars and it's Mochizuki versus Davey. And there is, and it is unfortunate that we never get to discuss Davey again because there is just a a strange, perverse, but genuine entertainment I have watching Davey Richards in the context of the 2020 wrestling landscape. Well, we'll, we'll look at a lot of perverse enjoyment talking next episode. So we still have one more episode with Davey. So it's okay, Case. We'll get through it. But this is the last entering match for Davey Richards and Dragon Gate USA for this stint. And that's sad. Yeah. That stinks. Yeah, it is. Uh, up next, there's a promo where Jigsaw says he, quote, just doesn't like Granakuma and Yamato, which <laughs> just for whatever reason caught me in just the right moment. I was like, shit, that's really funny. Uh, and then he and Mike Quackenbush go on to say that they are not just the best tag team in America, but they're looking to be the best tag team on the planet. I have some bad news for them. Yeah. And it's interesting that they say this right after 
and Dave writes about this in the Observer write-up about this show, that it is clear that they're trying to make this Quacksaw team into the big face tag team in this promotion since uh, the Young Bucks, their variability, and Dragon Gate USA will come to a close in March. So it is like this, but then again, you also have like someone that... The one person that the 10 years has not been kind to, in my mind, is Mike Quack in the bush, and him in this promo just is like fingers, fingernails down a chalkboard to me. Like, yeah, well, like I said in the in one of the shows we talked about, I think I thought Quack was an actively bad announcer, and I, in a weird way, I understand the appeal of a Mike Quackenbush promo to some people, but I personally have no interest in it. I think it's just something like in the moment I was such a big Chikara fan, and there's still a lot of Chikara stuff at that time that still holds up, but. I just now, just more what I'm looking for. Maybe that's why is what I liked when I was in my early 20s versus what I like my 30s is greatly divergent. And maybe at this point, I'm like, okay, yeah, I you're involved in this match. I want to see more Jigsaw. I want to see more of other people in the Chikara like universe and these Dragon Gate scenarios and Mike Quackenbush. I think that's what it comes down to for me. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that is just, I, it's just strange. I think the next match that we'll talk about is is strange in a weird way too. It's Speed Muscle versus Shingo and Yamato versus the Young Bucks in a triple threat elimination tag match. Yeah, so this was a match that I thought it's really cool. And then when I was rewatching this, it kind of struck me that the next show, the next weekend of shows, we will have the famed Dragon Dragon Gate Trios match. But over like the period of time, we had the great tag match, which which is very common in Dragon Gate nowadays on the Freedom Gate show between Speed Muscle and DK and Shingo. We had all the great singles matches, but this is like our first three-way tag. And I like this match. This was probably, this was my match tonight. I really enjoyed it, but it does have this this really weird veneer of awkwardness because this was happening during a time where Kamikaze, we'll get more into that main event, Kamikaze is going to be taking a certain bent in both Dragon Gate and in this promotion. As we said earlier, this is really when the wheels are turning to set up what's happening in 2011, which might still be some of the promotion's best work. And then you have a speed muscle team that is Masato Yoshino. Right after he got his head shaved, they would become, I believe, uh, Twin Gate champions, or they were recently Twin Gate champions as of like the time of this near to the show. So it just was a very odd time. And then you have Shingo and uh, Yamato, who were the most recent Twin Gate tag team champions before the they lost to Shima and Gamma, and then Shima and Gamma vacated the title. So the, the overall atmosphere of this match was kind of awkward, but I came away thinking this was my match of the night. I thought this was one of the few Young Bucks matches I've watched in my life that I left disappointed by. Okay. And I think part of it is that if this match happened to open the Historic Gate or even open the Untouchable Gate, and you had those crowds behind this match, I would have enjoyed it 10 times as, as much as I did. But... I thought this match kind of died a death in front of this crowd, which I don't totally understand why, because the work in a vacuum was good. I mean, you're dealing with Shingo and Yamato, who were a really, really strong tag team, and then Speed Muscle and the Young Bucks, who I think are two of you know the 10 greatest tag teams of all time at the very worst. And once again, Nick Jackson, I, real quick, Nick Jackson came away blowing my mind in this match because you just kind of forget with the Young Bucks like, they are now older. The Young Bucks we are watching have slowed down drastically. <laughs> this was just Nick Jackson bouncing off of everybody and doing every single move he knew, which was awesome. But the match just lost me at some point, which is a shame because I was very intrigued by the booking of this match because we really, I, or very rarely in Japan do we ever see matches this loaded where there's no clear fall post and there's no clear... I would say ranking among the teams like these sure. were evenly matched teams. And the fact that the young bucks were eliminated first, uh, when Yoshino hit a lightning lightning spiral on Matt Jackson shocked me. And then Yoshino ends up making Shingo tap with the Sol Naciente. So Yoshino comes away scoring both falls over two high profile tag teams. Yeah. And before we get into this, I had my dates wrong. Uh, Osaka Zenroku would defeat speed muscle in the finals to re reclaim the twin gate titles. They were not twin gate champions coming out of this or recently around this i had my cards messed up wrong but yeah no it's interesting because up to this point the young bucks were the feature tag team in this promotion but they're the first ones out after a pretty goofy first 10 minutes of this match 
Like this, this match had a lot more in common with like your Michinoku pros, like comedy, like multi man matches, and like how goofy Dragon Gate uh, Doi Darts matches can get to start. It had a lot more in common with that than like a three way tag that we see like on like Kobe World shows for the Twin Gates, you know? Well, in Dragon Gate USA, never nailed that aspect of the promotion of the. Uh, the matches that went a little more skewed towards wackiness or comedy. Um, the only attempt they really had at like a, a nine man three way trios match, like the, <laughs> you know, was, was heat 2012 where Uha nation gets hurt and the match kind of falls apart, but they never nailed those big multi-man clusters that can kind of teeter back and forth between being comedy and then also having a level of, intensity there that is common in any promotion uh, in japan they just never were able to balance that which i think is maybe more of a cultural thing than anything of just the american audiences i don't think they would have reacted well to those m- mixings uh, of the way that dragon Gate can kind of go back and forth i don't think an american audience quite honestly is smart enough to understand a lot of that so perhaps the wackiness that unfolded here just lost the crowd. And then I just never felt like they got them back, which is a shame because I know the work was good and I still liked this match, but I was like, Oh man, I, I remember that being better. This is one of the few matches I, or maybe the only match I've watched so far that I had a more positive memory of going in than I did. Uh, by the time I rewatched it, I, I remember liking this match a lot at one point, this viewing, it just let me down. This is, I think, like the first match that we're greatly divergent in this series because I gave this four and a quarter stars. Maybe I was able to zone out the crowd. Maybe it's all the uh, empty arena wrestling I've been watching. Maybe it had, <laughs> has got my expectations so low that that was something that didn't phase me as much. But I thought that, that when this really kicked into the sprint gear, this was exceptional. And sadly, a lot of that happened right after the Unbucks were out. So this was the when you had Takagi Yamato versus Speed Muscle, I felt like that that was exceptional work there, and especially with like the final stretch there, and they made such a big deal out of Yoshino had this losing streak. He was on the the bad end of the rivalry with Dragon Kid. Dragon Kid was now in the main event. Uh, he was back in tag team works, but he got two big falls in, like getting a fall on Shingo, especially in front of American audiences, where Shingo at least has been, always been portrayed as such a big star at this time, was so remarkable that it kind of in a lot of ways, especially after, you know, if we want to look at this overall Dragon System thing, he just lost what I believe, and I might be wrong, was the first big Apuesta's cage match. Like, he was someone that, like, was at the very low, and it's going to be interesting across 2010 as we, like, kind of follow these promotions and in uh, parallel, like, how sh- this kind of is the point where, oh, where Yoshino starts getting it back, starts getting it back, and then the way that he ends his 2010 and then as we get into 2011 it's a completely different uh Masato Yoshino than he was entering this year to your point about Shingo Takagi he is probably the most protected and arguably the biggest draw the promotion ever had so the idea of Yoshino submitting him here even though he had lost to Davey and that uh, he had lost in the Open the Historic Gate main event. He is still looked at as this prized commodity. And I think that is just also in part of the way that Shingo operates and carries himself. Wrestling would be better if there were more Shingo Takagis around. But, you know, even though he's lost two matches, it, it, submitting him here is still, it, and it got kind of that, oh, oh, okay. Like it still got a reaction. And then I, the tides turn a little bit and for the rest of his run Shingo is is dominant for the most part yeah yeah so it's an interesting aberration I the Chicago crowd now that we're really talking about it really disappointing and it, really disappointing and I don't understand why but it just yeah it, it, they really hurt this show for me at points yeah and it's something that you know in this match that we had like the big moment there and it leads into a main event that is a when we talk about this feeling like true Dragon Gate USA, this main event felt like a true Dragon Gate USA main event and that it was very good to grade at some points, but didn't hit the marks because you're dealing with a very young BB Hulk here. Yeah, it's just a weird match. Hulk does his best work, even as a heel, mind you, when he's getting the shit kicked out of him. 
Like, the reason the Hulk and Akira Tozawa, te- uh, Akira Tozawa tag team worked so well is that Akira Tozawa was able to carry a lot of the offense in those matches, and he was also able to carry the team with his charisma where Hulk could kind of sit back in the cut, be a little more creepy, be a little more gothic, and just kind of do his thing with his red drink and then spit mist and then kick, and it was a, it was a great tag team. I miss those days. Here, Hulk is working with the guy uh, in Dragon Kid who Dragon Kid can't throw him around, and Hulk doesn't really have the power offense that Dragon Kid needs to do his best work. There's a reason that to this point, this is one of their two singles matches in the history of these two existing, which is insane to think about a promotion where these guys have now been in the same company for 15 years. BB Hulk debuted in 2005. Dragon Kid was already there. They both battled injuries, but they've both been in the same company the entire time. And they've had two singles matches. That is the sort of stuff in Dragon Gate that blows my mind. But after watching this, it made me realize, eh, they probably don't need to be booked in a singles match ever again. And especially... 2010 BB Hulk we've talked about on the lead up to him becoming the first open the freedom gate champion greatly different worker than what we see in 2020 and especially even 20 2011 like this is still very much the pure as snow Hulk character we got the dancers back for one night and yeah that happened uh, okay so can somebody confirm to Mike whether or not or my, Mike and me rather I'm not throwing Mike under the bus yeah here. yeah yeah you always what, say don't tweet at me but now you're asking me to get tweeted at case come on okay, man. you can tweet tweet at open voice gate was Lacey one of BB Hulk's dancers because there is a woman that looks what I thought she was Lacey and then I asked Mike and he said no I don't think it was her Who, it wouldn't make any sense for it to be Lacey, but I also wouldn't past Gabe, wouldn't put it past Gabe to be like, Lacey, you got to go dance for BB Hulk. And clearly, whoever the two women were, I'm sure they're nice. They did not know what they were doing out there, and it was brutal and uncomfortable to watch. It was just awkward. It was very, very awkward. The other reason why I don't think it's Lacey is because she got she got attacked by John Moxley during the uh, big to do after the uh, Kendrick Jacobs match. Like I okay again, it wouldn't make sense right for it to be lazy. She, she has but certain this person looked, like, this that looks like looked her. a lot like yeah. lazy. Yes, um, I think 2011 BB Hulk would have had a really good match against Dragon Kid, but there was there was a certain smoothness to this match that whether it was Shingo versus Doi, whether it was uh, Davy versus Shingo, even Danielson versus Doi, the featured matches on Freedom Gate, there was just a a, a ruggedness that I think really helped those shows translate to an American audience because even, I mean, I just recently rewatched the match and, and actually went back and watched parts of it frame by frame and almost zapruded it in a way, but the do fixer versus blood generation, super crowd of honor match. Like there's a certain brutality to that match and a certain ruggedness in moments of that match that I think really translate to the American audience. Well here, Everything was just a little too smooth. It was like the worst parts of Christopher Daniels where every once in a while he is criticized because everything he does looks so good that it doesn't look like it hurts. That was a lot of this match of a lot of guys doing stuff that registered as offense, but maybe didn't have the impact that it necessarily needed to connect with the crowd on any sort of grand scale. Yeah, I think there's that. And also, at least if you were someone like me who was watching these shows primarily as a Dragon Gate fan, you already knew that Hulk was going to win. Dragon, yes. Dragon Kid gets his title shots, but since the company changed over to Dragon Gate, he is not the top guy. There was no doubt in your mind here, and Hulk was still like, he's not even five years pro at this point, and you're putting him in this kind of position, and the final stretch, maybe this is the thing about me and these matches, when Hulk turned it on and hit a very brutal first flash going into the EVOP to win, I bought that as a really good finish, but getting there, there was not very many moments Maybe if there was a there was an ultra Rana kick out, but maybe if he went for the dragon Rana, I would have bought myself into this match more. But I feel like that the result was never in doubt. It was never in doubt in 2010, and especially not in doubt now that this was just a supposed to be Hulk's first big defense. Yes, that's exactly it. You you are ultimately lacking some sort of big spot and hot closing stretch that Dragon Geek exist on that it relies on the house style needs those moments to take matches to the next level and we just never got it with this again not a bad match most things on the show with the exception of jacobs versus kendrick and i thought the chikara second gun match was way too long but most things on the show are not bad they are just so not as good as the first three shows and 
in a vacuum, I'm sure the show is fine, but we've been watching these shows in order and it stands out here that it's just like, oh, okay, this this was a bummer. This was not the shows that we had been getting. Yeah, it's not the shows we've been getting. It's not the shows that we would get after this. It, in a lot of ways, felt like that this was the show that they had to do before they got to Mania Weekend. And it really felt like that, especially everything after the match was much more heated than the match itself. It's just, you know, like, as I said, out of the first four shows, this is the weakest show. This is not a bad show. It's a decent show. It's just not the shows that, after the first three shows, attendance started to dip. We will talk later about the pay-per-view issues that they would have, because there were pay-per-view issues with this show that definitely play into how things went for the rest of 2010. And it's just kind of like, this is what Dragon Gate USA ended up being in 2010, and this title match is a big example of that. I will say, and we are kind of bearing the lead here, because after the match, Kamikaze, or what we would soon to know as Kamikaze USA attacks, Yamato, Davy Richards, Granakuma, they wipe out Shima, Dragon Kid, and Baby Hulk. Shingo comes out, he acts like he's pissed at Yamato, and then he decks Dragon Kid at this point. Uh, Shima, or I guess rather actually, Brad Allen runs in for the save, and he gets destroyed. Same with Eric Cannon. I did a fist pump on my couch when I saw Brad Allen run out, because honestly, if you would have watched Evolve 1, you would have thought, Oh, Brad Allen about to make the save here? <laughs> Brad Allen about to get pushed to the moon? <laughs> um, and then Shima comes out with a broom. He hits everything in sight, clears the ring, and then we get the first ever Dragon Gate USA Did You Enjoy the Show promo. Which is an important Shima... moment. This is the true it, Dragon Gate no, USA. It, it, it's really like a, a a moment in this promotion. There is something, and, and I say this in the genuest way possible, Shima writes his promo on the back of a run sheet, and I thought that was so charming that <laughs> Shima wanted to make sure he got everything right. Like, I am not knocking him at all. No. English is a dumb language. I can't believe people learn English. It, I speak English. I was raised on English, and it is impossible. I still get words on all, uh, wrong all the time. Shima writes his promo down and then reads it off the back of this paper, uh, just, you know, thanking Chicago, saying, you know, of course we're going to come back. And then Shima announces that he's, quote, bringing his best partner to WrestleMania weekend and then reveals that to be Gamma. Yes. Oh, no. 2010 Gamma, too. Yeah, no, no, no. Not 2020 Gamma. Worker of the year, mind you. This is 2010 Gamma. And it's just ridiculous. Like, I don't know. This this tells you how bad my memory is. They did a better job doing the fact that Dragon Kid left uh, Kamikaze and joined Warriors, which he was a much better fit to begin with with the whole Shingo thing, like, they did play off, like, oh, they were tag team partners, and then he just socked in the mouth, and, it, and Shingo had one of his great heel faces, like, six years before he really, like, mastered being the prime Dragon Gate heel, he had it here, like, he just, like, looked like the cockiest motherfucker popping him in the face, and then, absolute brawl, we had the Chikara guys came out, too, Brad fucking Allen was there, and it just was an absolute delight, Shima, of course, had the broom, and he was cleaning the room, the ring afterwards, and the crowd was going nuts. Like, Shin Shima was the most over person on this card. No wonder he was the person said to, to ask them if they're going to come back again. Because this is part of the Dragon Gate experience with Shima. They always wanted to make sure that everyone had a great experience there. And Shima wanted to make sure he got it right. And it was so charming. And he got 450 people in Chicago, Illinois to chant for Gamma. Uh, just a brave feat, something that I know I could not do. I will say that this closing angle, I thought really worked. I liked Absolutely. the kamikaze attack. The, the the build to Shima finally making the save was really strong. Like this at least gave the promotion some direction, which as we will find out is drastically altered uh, within two weeks of this show happening. But this was a very, very strong angle. Really enjoyed this to end the show. Yeah, and it's something that we'll be leading off next episode talking about how things changed. And if this was the angle that was going to go forward, if this is what Kamikaze USA was going to be, especially if Davey Richards is a part of it, completely different company, I would feel like. But that's not how things went. And Shima, God bless Shima. Like, like things like this, like, like whenever we talk about things being the Shima show, this was the Shima show. There is uh, something about this where I think just and, – and it's not something that normal people would care about. It's why we're here talking about it. Right. But, like, 
something about Davy Richards. It's one thing for the Ring of Honor and Dragon Gate USA stuff to happen and for Davy to no longer work. But it is easy to forget unless you watch these shows uh, in order like this. Davy Richards was going to be the face of the company. He was going to lead the top heel unit and was going to likely win the world championship at WrestleMania weekend on one of those shows. And everything blows up so quickly. And it is just, it's hard to believe. Like we had so much fun talking about Davey and rewatching these matches. This is the last time he has seen in Dragon Gate USA. This is the end of the line for Davey Richards. And we'll talk about it way more on our next show, but it, it should be noted here. Davey leads this attack. He comes out once again, like, there is a character element of Davy Richards that is kind of awesome to watch. And it's all built off of this like spinning back kick that he gave Brian Danielson. And then he continues that attitude into these next shows. And he is looked at as the guy and he is gone after this. It is totally insane to me rewatching this, that that much focus was put on Davy Richards. Yeah. And as we get into what happens in the next episode, day by day, this was a story that, when we get into it, I remember drastically changing. I remember it being a different world each day, logging on the websites and seeing the next step that was happening here and the next mess and the next mess. And it just turns into a great to-do, but it's such a striking last angle, especially leading into WrestleMania weekend, where it seems like you have Kamikaze Ascendant. You have BB Hulk, who's right now, you have reasonable doubt of what's going to happen when Hulk faces off against either Shingo, his generational rival, or Davey Richards, who's built up as the next big thing. How is Shima going to play into this? Because Shima had to come out and save Dragon Kid. Like, how that going to play into it? Gamma's going to be here, too. That's a thing. And then you have, like, all the things going on with uh, World 1 happening and with the Young Bucks. So the Young Bucks will be at WrestleMania week, and we'll talk about the circumstances of their exit then. But this really is one of those moments. Like, last time, I remember mentioning, like, the sins of Gabe Sapolsky. There's nothing that happens after this that I could say between this show and WrestleMania weekend that I would call his fault about this fallout with Davey Richards. He's certainly not the person to blame the most. Fault is maybe a different story. That's fair. That's fair. He does not yes. have ultimate culpability in the situation. Yes, it is one time. Well, I mean, I spent a lot of time defending Gabe. I will once again, to an extent, back him on this one as well. Do we want to preview the next show before we go? Should we talk about the what the card ends up being or what the card should have been? Let's talk about what the card ends up being. Okay, I have this yes. pulled up right now. So the next show will be a part of WrestleMania weekend on March 26, 2010. It will be a show from the Celebrity Theater in Phoenix, Arizona. We have a pretty, pretty big show that's going to happen. As an opening dark match, we have an eight-way fray case. With Jake Christ, Dave Christ, our boy Brad Allen, Dustin, <laughs> Dustin Cutler, Malachi Jackson, Brandon Cutler, Chimera, and the Prophet. We have Malachi Jackson represent. Go Ma ahead, Mike. Yeah, I mean Dustin Cutler represent. I mean we we, <laughs> we got a lot of this is a real sign of the times. We have a singles match between Luke Hawks and Yamato. Yamato at this time worth stating recently won the Open the Dreamgate Championship. The next match we have. A incredible tag match. We have Ginky Horiguchi and Susumi Yokosuka versus Jig Jigsaw and Mike Quackenbush. We have another singles match between TJP and Yamato. I don't think we'll be seeing both of these Yamato matches. We have a tag match that is kind of remarkable as we have Brian Kendrick and John Moxley versus Jimmy Jacobs and Paul London. We have Shingo versus Masato Yoshino. And how about this for a tag match? Derek Nykirk and G. Q Gallo versus El Hio del Rey Mysterio and LA Park. And then our double main event is the Open the Freedom Gate title match between BB Hulk and Naruki Doi. And then the first of two Dragon Gate six man tag matches as Jack Evans and the Young Bucks team up against so they can face against the Warriors team of Shima, Dragon Kid, and Gamma. Mike, do you see the runtime on that Lucha tag match? I okay. Let me pull the results. I was doing it without spoilers. Yeah, oh boy. I, oh sorry, boy. sorry, sorry, but oh my god, I don't want to watch that. The thing, the things I do for content. I tell you what. He, that is, 
Okay. Yeah. We gotta see if there's a clipped version. <laughs> if we can get someone to cut that down. I, for I, us. I'll put myself through this. <laughs> you, 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 know, you know what? I could probably find this match and then I'll give it to people and have them submit reviews to a, to us for this match because this match looks dreadful. It is the longest match on the show by a good three minutes. So. Oh boy! All right. Well, that's what's coming next. That's what's coming next. This is open the ultimate gate and then the next show after that is when we get into the really solid stuff as we get the first mercury rising show so it's wrestlemania weekend coming up on the next two episodes of rewind and rewatch are right, is there any big events that i'm missing out on that we should talk about before we let the people go for this episode of our retro rewatch series mike i have nothing going on other than my twitter which is at underscore in your case the open the voice gate twitter account which is at open voice gate and my music podcast that mike spears was a guest on uh, at this point, it'll be two weeks ago, I think, by the time this comes out, mm-hmm. uh, the Art School Albums podcast. Other than that, I got nothing going on. I'm at Fujiheya. I'm probably tweeting about tracksuits or about whatever this world has le- led me to at this point. But find me there. But that's going to do it for this episode of Open the Voice Gate, Rewind and Rewatch. And we'll be back with you next week with WrestleMania Weekend 2010, everybody. Take care.